little over 25 years ago, there was a book that came out by Alan Bloom. It was a bestseller here in the country. It took the nation by storm, as I read in this uh, press release, but it did. It was called The Closing of the American Mind. And what is it like now, if it was closed then, what is it like now 25-plus years later? Uh, this book by Alan Bloom was basically uh, a look at how our country had kind of lapsed, especially in the college and the way we were teaching in college and so forth, how it lapsed into damaging habits of ignorance, narcissism, entitlement, sensitivity, inexpressiveness, and distraction, all the things we talk about all the time here on this show. Well, there is a book that's coming out on June 16th, and I was referring to this some last week. I got an advanced copy of it that was sent to me from my friend Stephen Manfredi. 16 Leading Critics on the New Anti-Intellectualism, the State of the American Mind. And it's a book that has been uh, edited by Mark Bauerlein and Adam Bellow. Adam Bellow being the son of uh, Saul Bellow, an outstanding uh, thinker here in our country for a long time. The guy was a pretty good friend, by the way, of uh, Alan Bloom, who wrote the book back in 1987, The Closing of the American Mind. I was so taken by this book <clears throat> that I wanted to get the editor on today for an hour. I normally never book a, an interview past a half an hour. Today is one of those unusual times because I think there's a lot to say here and a lot to ask about. And Mr. Bauerlein has accepted the, the idea that uh, you can give a call about this as you hear this this morning. You do not want to miss this interview. As you hear this this morning, you have questions, please give us a call at one 800 357 and take part in the discussion. But I am re very, very pleased to introduce this morning Mark Bauerlein, who's an English professor at Emory University, senior editor of First Things Magazine, as well as editor of this new book coming out, The State of the American Mind. 16 leading critics, including Mark Bauerlein, are written up in this particular book. And we welcome Mr. Bauerlein to the show. Mark, it's great to have you on the show. Good morning to you. Oh, I'm glad to join you. Oh, well, I t I'll tell you what. I read. I started reading this. I have not read the whole way through it, uh, but I have read a, a number of different parts of it, and I am fascinated uh, by this whole idea of the state of the American mind, especially using this closing of the American mind 25 plus years ago as a backdrop. And I have to ask you, you know, why did you assemble this collection of essays? What what is really your thought right now in getting all these people who are critics of this so-called new anti-intellectualism? Well, Adam Bellow, my co-editor, and I, we, we, we read a lot. We're, you know, involved in, in, in the media world, and, and I'm in the academic world as well. So we see things going on, and we, we look at, you know, the, the intellectual habits of Americans. That was what we, what we mean by the American mind. Sure. It's sort of that composite of all the beliefs, attitudes, and how much knowledge Americans typically, typically have. And what we see progressively and we do believe it's, it's getting worse, is uh, some, some of the trends that Alan Bloom opined about now being really coming forward with a lot of concrete empirical evidence that we're, we're not as smarter, we're not as knowledgeable, we're not as civically engaged as we have in the past. And, and it's, time to, uh, it's time to start uh, broadcasting this condition. As I listen to our, and I'll use our politicians for a moment, and our so-called, um, I sometimes say our betters supposedly, uh, today speak to us, if it wasn't the fact that they are taken so seriously by a media in this country today that seems not to have much of a filter in terms of intelligence, uh, it would be laughable. You know, when you hear them say, well, you know, we would like to have clean water and we want to have, you know, and people say, well, really? Let me write that down. I mean, all this kind of silliness today that you kind of point to in this book and you say, it's important for people to listen and hear and to look and see. A lot of people listen, but they don't hear. And a lot of people look, but they don't see. And it seems to me as I read through this book that you're asking people to not only listen, but hear, and not only look, but see as well. Is that a fair statement? Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me say uh, when high school seniors in this country take the U.S. history exam, the federal U.S. history exam, more than half of them score below basic, right. which, which is an F. When they ask the general public questions about, about our structure of government, when they ask about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, when they ask about the founders, we, we, we know the answers. They're awful. Hardly anybody knows when the Civil War took place. And, and that's not, in America, that is not just an intellectual or an academic problem. 
the founders understood that when you have the people as sovereign, they have to know what's going on. They have to know what is happening in, in, inside the government. Who knew what Lois Lerner was doing for a long time mm -hmm. before, almost by accident, it all came out? How much goes on inside the government that we aren't aware of? And if people don't listen to intelligent journalism and discussion and, and debate, then they are going to deteriorate as a civic citizenry, and they're going to end up with the leaders they deserve. So that, that, that's a roundabout way of explaining why, and I, I thoroughly agree with you, political discourse in this country, it, it, it's so superficial, it, it's so slogan-like. But that, that, that's not just the politicians. Sure, no, I'm, I'm just using that as one example. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have a burden in this country. The people bear a burden of knowledge. You have to know what's going on in order to exercise your freedoms responsibly. And we, we, we just don't. We have to cultivate those great virtues of self-reliance, Protestant work ethic, independence, you know, the self-made man right. that was laid out by the first settlers here, by Ben Franklin, by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry Thoreau and Booker T. Washington. All those great historical figures have to be held up as role models. Now, well, uh, when you've got, according to one of our contributors, Nick Eberstadt, when you've got 49% of the people in this country living in households taking a check from the government... Self-reliance is not going to be the number one virtue in that household. One of the things that really is interesting in what you're saying is the idea that there is an American mind. You know, for a long, long time, we said there's an American mind on a lot of the things that you just mentioned. You know, blue-collar ethic, uh, rugged individualist, all that kind of stuff. You know, when we moved west, we had all that rugged individualism, and then we got to be a little bit more of an equal kind of society in terms of rights. We got into all that stuff. And by the way, you're talking to a guy who taught history for 25 years, so it hurts when I hear about you are, you're, you're on the front lines. I was on the front lines for a long time. Uh, now, I retired back in 1987, but I was there, and I, I actually believed in teaching history as it was, and as it, you know, it should be presented, not revisionist history, but I, I believed uh, a lot in teaching the Constitution, uh, civics, a lot of those things that are no longer taught. So I guess I'm a little bit of an old timer that way. But I also believed that there was an American mind and that there were traits of the American mind, some of which you just described a moment ago, that gave us the idea of oneness. And one of the things that you talk about in the foreword, which I thought was brilliant, by the way, uh, in the foreword, was the idea that the American mind, where we thought more and more people were going to get involved in this and really understand the structure of the American mind and the opportunities of the American mind, has gone another way. It's gone into a division, uh, so much so that everybody's view of America is absolutely entirely different. Uh, talk a little bit about that, if you would. Well, you, you know, when immigrants came to this country in the the big wave of European immigration in the 1890s, first decade of the, the 20th century, you, 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 you could hear those people say, the proudest day of my entire life was the day I swore my oath and became an American citizen. Right. I was an Italian, I was Russian, I was Jewish, I was Catholic, but I was also an American. I was part of a common national identity. And it was it was it was a it was a, a point of pride for them. And and over the course of our history but we've always generalized on what is an American. Emerson wrote his essay The American Scholar. Uh, the the Ben Franklin does his autobiography, and he says, I'm a role model of the American. Walt Whitman declares in Leaves of Grass, I am an American, one of the roughs. We always talked about what is this new world citizen, the national character. And we know that that was just a generalization, but, but, it, but it carried the, the things by which we would hope would organize our lives. And we had those virtues and those, and those ideals, and we were different. We were different yeah. from Europe. We're different from anywhere on Earth, and we, we should take pride in that. But as you say, we do not have that ideal 
of common national identity anymore. The big word is diversity. Yeah. We're all part of what this group or that group. It is multiculturalism. And, and what has happened here is not the elimination. Uh, I, mean, I mean, what I'm calling for is not the elimination of diversity. Is mm-hmm. Let's keep the old e pluribus unum. We can have plurality, but we have to have a common unity as well. And our unity doesn't come from our race or our gender or our religion. We have all different kinds of those things in this country. Our unity comes from our national commitment. We know the Constitution. We honor Abraham Lincoln. We honor the civil rights Movement. It's always it's always evolving, but there has to be a common ground, or we we just we, well we end up with a culture and the politics that we have a deteriorating one. You know, it was interesting last week, and, and coming right off the back of that, uh, the president last week went out to talk about uh, Immigrant Heritage Month. And he said, we are a nation of immigrants. Like, we didn't know that. I'm pretty sure that we've known that for a long time. He said, it's it's a source of strength and something we can take pride in. Uh, The president also said, we can't just celebrate this heritage. We have to defend it by fixing our broken immigration system. Now, obviously, he had a political bent to part of that. But the point is... We continue, and this I think this is this is part of the if symptom, or maybe it's even the result. Uh, when we say we are celebrating our differentness rather than our unity, we are celebrating the idea of hyphenated America. This whole idea that we all have a hyphen behind our name, uh, as opposed to being American and, and this this experiment and being Captain Obvious about it, telling us that yeah, we're a nation of immigrants. We knew that, and yet at the same time, the beauty of this nation of immigrants was that it was able to assimilate into one American purpose, one American spirit that we're talking about here this morning. Yeah, you, you, you taught you taught history. Were you high school, college level? Uh, junior high and then college, and then high school. And junior high and then high school, and I taught on the AP level a lot of times. Okay, so you, you, you know that uh, the revisionist history, starting, what, in the 60s, 70s, right. the Howard Zinn version of history, really wants to take down American exceptionalism, American unity. It doesn't like the melting pot process. And and so what they didn't predict was if you don't give people something in their past to feel proud of, if, if as Gary Nash, the historian who helped write those awful U.S. history standards in the mid-'90s, as he's put it on, on a TV interview, I think it was ABC's 2020, when someone said, I mean, this, this encapsulates everything, I think it was uh, it was an Andrea Mitchell, maybe Diane Sawyer, who said to him, "What is the most important thing young people learn about George Washington?" Do you, do, do you know what he said to that? I don't remember. No, that he owned slaves. Yeah. Now, if that's what you're learning in a classroom when you're 18 years old, why should you remember that? That yeah. doesn't that doesn't make you feel it. The father of our country, the man admired all over the world, this is what is important. No wonder kids and American adults don't know anything about history. You're not giving them something meaningful, again, to feel good about, to take pride in them. And it's not about being... You know, sugarcoating everything and falsifying no. the past, but we've gone way too far on the side of cynicism and negativity. America is a beacon to the world. Of and course we have we have our crimes and sins like every nation does. But my goodness, let's understand that Thomas Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence were an inspiration of Martin Luther King. And the idea also that we are continually trying to form a more perfect union than maybe even the one that started. We're going to come back more with Mark Bauer line. We're going to take a very quick break. Uh, you're welcome to call in 1-800-357-0910 as we talk about the state of the American mind. It's a brand new book. It's coming out on June 16th. I'm telling you what, you need to get your hands on this. 16 leading critics of the new anti-intellectualism. We're going to get into more of that anti-intellectualism and why it's eroding here in America's culture when we come back with Mark here on the Gary Sutton Show on News Radio 910 WSBA.
Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. I was just chatting off uh, line, or off air here with Mark Bauerlein, who's the editor of this new book that's coming out on the 16th. It's called The State of the American Mind. Uh, Mark Bauerlein and Adam Bello uh, are the editors of this book. We've got a caller online for Mark this morning. Tom and York, you're first up with Mark Bauerlein. Go ahead, Tom. You're trying to make the call. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I just want to say that uh, uh, I just have a real um, issue and problem with the fact that in debate in this country, starting all the way back to the Revolutionary War, where he told the King of England, we're not paying you taxes if we can't have representation in Parliament. I am personally filled with righteous indignation that whenever we have arguments and debate in this country, and a guy like me, who is a conservative, Christian, Republican, white male, when we talk about things like tax cuts, a strong national defense, a legitimate, clear uh, cut in government spending, telling Hollywood to take their uh, cesspool BS as far as the screwing up of our culture where Bruce Jenner claims he's a woman because he had some pervert uh, surgeon chop something off his body, that we can't tell people like that that they're wrong and then tell everybody why we're right and then substantiate that with verification right. with the facts and, and the accuracy and the clarification and the honesty of it, uh, that we're, filled with peop- we're people filled with hate when we do such right. things because they can't legitimately debate someone like me, more importantly, God, like a Rush Limbaugh or Michael Savage because all they can do is shout racist or shout someone right. you're a hater and I just would like to have you give a few comments about that if you don't mind. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Well, we, th- this is the logical outcome of one, moral relativism. Moral relativism tells us, one, we can't judge. Right. Who are we to judge? That line, of course, is often misquoted from the, from the scriptures. We often forget the part that who am I to judge someone who is genuinely, sincerely trying to come to God. Uh, but the moral relativism then leads to politics. And right now we're all in the midst of identity politics. Identity politics is everywhere. I mean, the civil rights movement was not about identity politics and its origins, but we have gone from... Great civil rights leaders to who? Al Sharpton. Right. I mean, this this tells you it's a political power game. I mean, you're you're righteously indignant, but you have to understand that these are political tactics in order to advance the interests of certain groups, or at least the leaders of those groups. So uh, I, it's a mistake to take a lot of these arguments seriously as intellectual arguments. They are instead forms of power plays. It's it's interesting to me, Mark, and, and listening to what Tom had to say. And I think this is important, too, for people who would be intellectual in this country to say, okay, don't get caught up. I, I, I watch Republicans and Democrats, and I don't have a whole lot of regard for either necessarily. But I watch the Republicans get into the same kind of... Um, colloquialisms, uh, cliches, whatever you want to call them, that the Democrats do many times. Um, I'm waiting, whether they be Democrat, Republican, conservative, or liberal, I'm waiting to some, for someone to say, and the same people are usually screaming to high heavens out there, let's have that debate. I'm ready to have that conversation, which is usually code speak for, I don't want to have that conversation at all because I don't know anything about it. But I'd love to hear them say... Uh, here is my belief, and here's why I believe it. You know, one of the things that Tom was saying, he, he said some of the things that would be the headlines, but I think it's incumbent upon people of goodwill who are intellectuals in this country to sit down and say, and here's why I believe what I believe. Now, I realize the press isn't necessarily going to report that all the time, but I do think if there was a, a blizzard of that constantly, you could hardly help but let that get through as, as some good reasoning, even though I know there are many people out there who will resort to exactly what Tom said by calling you some kind of ist or uh, some kind of name because they're not equipped to engage in that game. Your thoughts? I'm afraid that the politicians uh, in this country on all sides are terribly scared. Yeah. They are frightened to death of saying the wrong thing. They have to be so scripted 
because what they say could be construed as racist or right. sexist or homophobic. Those are our prevailing, uh, uh, prevailing labels these days, and they, they can be cancellations. And they see just such an onslaught of media right now that they've got to watch their words at all times. I mean, we're all human beings. We all suffer from vices, and we have some virtues. We're going to make mistakes now. That's just natural. But today's mistakes, if they get on camera or if, if they're on the microphone, they can kill you. So we end up with, with politicians who have to be so bland. They know journalists are out there waiting for a gotcha moment. Right. And... and so we end up with this very artificial politics. We and and you know one of the ways you can see how artificial is when someone says something stupid. What is amazing is the pile on. <laughs> Instead right. of it being oh look so and so and so made an idiot remark, it goes on and on. We get CNN bring on the the people to debate the meaning of these remarks. What is this? What does this have? What what meaning does this have for our society as a whole? What does this say about America? And they they just amplify it to absurd lengths, and you realize this is all just street theater. Right. This isn't even real. Politics. And then they immediately say, "I misspoke," or "I'm walking back the truth," which has become one of the new statements that we have in our society. I, 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 I'll, I'll give you. You want me to give you? An sure. Example? Go ahead. Yeah. When Hillary Clinton goes on the radio with Terry Gross last year to, I, I heard this uh, while I was driving, to discuss her book, uh, which had just came out. Uh, and Terry Gross, the book is about being Secretary of State, all the things going on in the world. We've got the Middle East. We, we've, we've, we've got North Africa. We, we have, I mean, Iraq and, and Russia. Everything is, is happening. Terry Gross's first question was about LGBT rights and how Hillary Clinton inserted those into official U.S. policy on human rights in the world. And Hillary said, yes, that is one of my most proud accomplishments. And I want to say wow. this, this is the first thing that you want to talk about given everything going on in the world. That tells you where our political interest, or at least how, how, how they've just become so distorted by identity concerns. You wrote in the first chapter, you were one of the 16 contributors here, by the way, and you wrote in the first chapter, uh, and I thought it was really interesting, coming back to education for a moment, and you said this, this line, you said, why, we wonder, do so many high school students, college students, and younger workers seem so terribly deficient in basic knowledge and skills? Their reasoning abilities may have jumped forward, their ability to learn may make the 1950s uh, mind appear lethargic, but their reading comprehension hasn't improved at all. What happened along the way? Well, I think that uh, there, there there are several things happening here. One, we've get we've got more more kids tuning out on the digital age stuff, the social media. They are not paying as much attention to the news. They're not reading as many books, newspapers, magazines. They're not engaging in intelligent conversation with grown-ups. If you're 17 years old, you run about uh, 3,500 text messages a month on average. All those text messages are between you and your friends and what's going on. We have what's called age segregation. And all you have to do is read those text messages to see just how puerile, juvenile, crude, and illiterate yeah. that communication is. And, of course, the pictures. They, they yeah. send in Instagram. You know, half of all the pictures on Instagram sent by teenagers are selfies. They walk around with 200 pictures of themselves in their pocket at all time. And when you add up all those hours with the social media, then you're going to find that uh, over the years, months and years, that their literacy capacities are, are going to stumble. And this is what we see. So many students, so many kids go into college 
and they end up in remedial reading and writing courses because they just can't handle college-level work. My wife went back to school after 27 years of working. She had had an associate's degree, and she was 27 years an outstanding respiratory therapist, but decided she wanted to go back and get her degree. Uh, and one of the things that she told me one day when she came home, she said, you will not believe this. And I said, what? She said, this one girl, uh, here's my wife, who's very self-conscious about going to school with all these younger people. So this one girl came in, and she had her paper failed and turned back to her because she wrote it in text language. Uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I, I was stunned. I, I, but, but, she but, didn't know Gary, any better. She did not now, know any better. Now, now Gary, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the thing that really surprises me about that story. She got an F. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in nineteen, well, well, you know, Gene Twenge has has a great chapter uh, on youth and narcissism and education in the book. And here are some of the statistics that Gene brings up. In nineteen sixty, the percentage of grades given in college that were A's. Fifteen percent. Right. Now, C was the most common grade. Now, forty-five percent, forty-three to forty-five wow. percent of grades are A's. A is by far the most common grade given. More than half of kids who go to college today leave high school with an A GPA. Now, so we we've been rewarding them for this this kind of work. We we, we great inflation has given them completely the wrong message about themselves and so they all believe themselves above average it was amazing i remember one time where i had given out a number of f's um for a marking period when i was a history teacher and so did my colleagues i had two colleagues one on either side of me who also happened to be you know we gave us and we got called in and the principal didn't say, well, you know, that's bad. But he said, you know, do you think maybe there's too many out there? Are you guys too tough? And, and that kind of thing. And we're all sitting there saying we're teaching the curriculum basically as it had been laid out. And we were doing the right things. And, and kids had to reach a certain level. And they didn't do that. And so, you know, we saw even then back in the early 1970s where the pressure then came from on high to say, well, you know, you, you got to pass Johnny here, even if, or, or Joni, even if they're not doing well, because we can't have this large group of people staying back here because then that's your fault. Um, and, and so you, you see that kind of pressure out there uh, right now. I want to switch to another area. Uh, in the second chapter, and this is one we talk about a lot. People say, well, when, when they stop reading the Bible in school, that's when things went to hell in a handbasket. And, and, and I, there's a tendency to want to dismiss that. And yet at the same time, the Bible or the idea that we have some moral basis in this community called the United States of America is rather important, is it not? Here's, here's a statistic brought up by Daniel Dreisbach, who right. wrote this article about how important biblical literacy is to American citizenship. Between 1760 and 1805, in political writings in the United States, the most commonly cited book was not John Locke or Montesquieu or any political theorists or thinkers. It was Deuteronomy, right. the book in the Old Testament, which gives the fullest the fullest uh, account of the Ten Commandments. Uh, that, that, that explains why. The story of Exodus was crucial to all the New England colonists. They were leaving a place of persecution just as the Jews were leaving Egypt. Right. And they were passing through the water, the Red Sea. Well, the Puritans, pilgrims were passing over the Atlantic, and they were going out into the wilderness, and they were trying to enter the promised land and to create a God-fearing community. So they, they constantly talked to, ab about this mission, this errand across the, across the world in biblical terms. And you would often see the colonies referred to as our American Israel. So Understanding the Bible, then, is essential to understanding where our country came from. And, and I'll add to this, New England in 1750 had pretty much the highest literacy rates in the entire world, and it had it for one reason. Everyone read the Bible. You had to read the Bible. The Bible was the most important educational instrument in the, in the early days. And, you know, we, we talk about the Bible, and, and even then, you think about the early university with Yale and Harvard and places like that, and what were they being trained for? Being trained to be ministers many times, uh, to go to the university at that particular point in time. The Bible, to me, it's almost like we're afraid to engage in conversation 
uh, about the Bible in this country, and uh, people are made to feel as though somehow, uh, you know, to to cite that, oh, you must be trying to indoctrinate me. What what are you doing? You can't have a conversation about it because you're always trying to indoctrinate. The Bible contains too many strictures that run against the, the the cultural sexual revolution that we've undergone in the last 50 years. The Bible certainly is pushing for marriage and chastity and the traditional family structure. Right. The Bible is judgmental about the non-working individuals. It was very important to maintain the distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. Well, that is going to cause problems for people who want to push the welfare state. And finally, the Bible says obedience. Obedience to God. You are to submit yourself to a higher authority. And that runs up against the whole rampant individualism and self-esteem and and libertine attitudes of of certainly our, our our mass culture. You know what else it does? It provides absolutes. I mean, there are absolutes in there, and of course, we're in a day and age where if you don't like the absolutes, people tend to want to go construct gray areas that then suit their particular individual agenda. Right? That's right. That's right. I mean, we we want to explain bad away bad behavior. Right. We we don't want to judge it. We want to find social and and uh, historical reasons for people's immorality. We certainly don't want to accept anything like the idea of original sin. I was amazed we were watching the uh, protests and the and the riots for at least one day in Baltimore. Uh, last month, and we heard a lot of people say, listen, I'm not in favor of this, but. And so the moment they go to but, you know it's coming off the absolute, and it's going to come to, but I'm going to try to rationalize while burning down a CVS and why burning down what was going to be a a senior citizen's home thing uh, is okay. You know, that that somehow we have that ability now to, to, at a much higher intellectual level, understand that. To me, that's total anti-intellectual level. That's just trying to make a wrong or right. Who, who, and well, what about the people who are suffering from those riots? Amen. Do you have any sympathy for them? Or the people who were in that community who, and here's where the word invested really does come true, not the invested where they raise their taxes, but you say, people who invested who said, I'm going to I'm going to be in this community, I'm going to be among my people here, I'm going to make sure that the people in my community have ability to come and, and, and take part in services and get products that are, you know, and then you burn the place down. And and so now how do you, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? Well, not I, you, but I'm just saying in general. I'm just throwing the word I out. Know, I know. I know. I think. I think that a, a big part of this is, uh, first of all, we see a crisis of progressive urban policy here. Right. I mean, we we have poured so much money into these communities, and we're doing things like trying trying to build these communities. And as soon as anyone gets on on his on his feet, he wants out of that community, and he leaves. So, you know, I think you see progressivist dreams here turning into nightmares, and that's very hard for progressives to accept. It's much easier, I think, to distort reality, to rationalize, to explain away the evidence right in front of you than it is to maybe accept or realize that what you have believed and what you have committed to for a long time is a failure. Do you think that uh, these people who are the anti-intellectuals in this country and and engage in that kind of type of of conversation where it it tethers the dependent to them because of lack of knowledge are waiting for the traditional generation and the baby boomer generation to die out because with them last vestiges of maybe any intellectuals uh, conversation will go with them? I wonder. Just a thought. I wonder, I mean, well, one thing to remember about a lot of the academics and commentators on the urban situation and the riots, they don't live there. No. They don't spend much, they don't have much experience there. Uh, What I have seen in academia is the people who are the most indignant about social injustice, the people who get most fired up 
about racism and and uh, various forms of victimization are people who grew up in very comfortable households, went to prep schools, right. private schools, all their lives. They have lived very well, and yet they have cultivated forms of resentment that they turn around and apply to victims that they find in the world. They don't know those victims. They misconstrue those victims. But I think it serves forms of emotional, psychological need for them. And I, I just... I just, I just don't, I just don't trust their opinions. Well, what's really interesting about the opinions too? We're going to get to Joe here in a second, who's on the line. But is this? We seem to want to go, and we see it again, particularly in the political uh, conversation, because that seems to permeate our lives every single day, whether we like it or not. But the polar ends, which to me are the simplistic ends, instead of delving down into the complex part of a debate and saying, "Well, here are some of the things that." that maybe bring us around to this. You know, for example, if if you don't support something, then you must hate it. Hate it. Well, it's, it's not like that. I mean, a good debate, good intellectualism says, well, there's, there's other parts to this if, if you're willing to listen. And the problem is we're in this sound bite mentality today where we refuse to really listen to that a lot of times, don't we? I, 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 I think so. Um, I mean, there's they're, they're sort of a mix with uh, decaying ideas and the media presentation of them these days. Well said. The, the, the sound bite, the short, the, ta- the, the, the talking head, the people who are, who are asked to talk about things, and they have so little knowledge about them. But right. they, they, you, 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 you put them on camera. You know, I, I, if you go onto YouTube, you can find an old 1967 debate discussion with Bobby Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Reagan is governor of California at this time. Bobby Kennedy is gearing up for a presidential run in 68. You have a series of journalists and students, I believe it took place at Yale, throwing questions at them. And the journalists are very hostile. They're very anti. Some of them are foreign journalists, and they're very anti-American. And, of course, it's all about Vietnam right. for them. But if you listen to Bobby Kennedy and Reagan, I think Reagan wins this debate between the two of them, hands down. But I give Bobby Kennedy credit as well for being intelligent, thoughtful, and firm respondents. They're not trying to score points. They're not trying to make a quick uh, catchphrase. It is a level of discussion and thought that is so far superior to what we see typically. There's legitimate today. basis there for what they say, rather than just saying, I'm saying this because this is what I feel. Uh, it's something that you've put together, you've learned, you've, you've formed some kind of basis for a rational and, uh, you know, a good kind of thought that can be discussed. That we're, you know, I, we're listening for that all the time here on on radio. Why do you believe what you believe? Don't just say this is what I believe because the club told you to say that. Say it because you really believe it, and tell us, break it down. Then why why do you believe what you believe? You have to know things in order to form your beliefs. Bingo. I mean, this it is very hard for people to give arguments if they if they don't know. What well, is going on? If you, if you it, I mean, first of all, the number of people who pay attention to current events, politics, and, and, and society keeps going down. According to one of our contributors, right. David Mindich, who is talking about news consumption, especially among the young, but in 2000, uh, more than half of young people watch news on TV. In 2012, only one-third of them do. In 2000, one-half of all American adults read a newspaper with regularity. And it could be digital or print. Now we're down to 23%. We're under one-quarter. These are according to, to Pew's, uh, Pew's numbers. So the, the, the number of people just paying attention. And have we, ever lived, have we ever lived at a time where we had more... A more bl- of a blizzard of information than we have right now. Mark, exactly. I need to, need to run to a break. We're going to come back, take Joe's call, and I want to close out our interview, although I could do five hours with you, and I don't think we'd still touch all the things in this book, but uh, The State of the American Mind. The editor with us today here is Mark Bauerlein. I am fascinated. I hope you are, too. Feel free to give a call, 1-800-357-0910. I have a feeling this will not be the only interview we'll do with him. I hope you will maybe... 
assent to being with us uh, or accept my uh, invitation to be with us again to talk about this a little bit more. It comes out on June 16th, The State of the American Mind. Write it down right now. It's a book you want to pick up, and I'm telling you what, as I've read through different chapters so far, it is just absolutely one of the best that I've read. We'll be right back with Mark Bauerline, and take your calls right after this on News Radio 910 WSBA. Joe in Denver, we lost you. Please feel free to give a call back. We want to get you in here and your question for Mark Bauerlein. Mark, Bar- Mark Bauerlein is the editor of the State of the American Mind. 16 leading critics on the new anti-intellectualism in this country. You wrote something very interesting here, Mark, and, and let me quote. Uh, America lies in bits and pieces and its citizens are disengaged, tuned out, self-involved. They set social life above civic life, racial and sexual identity over American identity. Our intellectuals are constrained by diversity from drawing the people together and America Americanizing them, and so are most educators and politicians. But diversity isn't a faith, it's an anti faith passing as one. When people hear its dogmas, they shrug, roll their eyes, or nod in thoughtless compliance and go back to work and play. This is the predominant state of the American mind. It's not enough to sustain a free republic. Uh, as you round it up, the current state of the American mind today, why is it such a threat to freedom? Well, you know, in the famous statement, when Ben Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, a woman said, what have you created here? He said, a republic, (laughs) if if you you can can keep keep it. it. And you keep it by knowing things such as what is in the First Amendment. You keep it by keeping watch on what those figures in the corridors of power are up to. You keep it by listening to intelligent radio and television and newspapers. We need the press. We need journalists to let us know what is going on. The government is too big and complicated for us to do it ourselves. That's why the founders put the freedom of press in the First Amendment. They hated journalists. They despised them. Jefferson and Washington hated them, but they knew they are instrumental in keeping our civic sphere healthy. But the journal, but but the people have to pay attention. And if they don't, again, we end up with the, the leaders we deserve. You know, I remember all the way back to a John Peter Zenger trial um, in New York uh, where they tried to go after um, the whole idea that a guy would write something about the governor. The governor tried to come down him, and John Peter Zenger was, I think he was uh, defended by Andrew Hamilton at that particular time, pretty good lawyer, and got off. But that was kind of the basis for the whole um you know, freedom of the press kind of idea. And yet the press seems to have ceded that freedom over today to becoming complicit in the news or wanting to make the news. And I've often kidded with people and not kidded with them. I've often observed that, you know, we look back to the Watergate uh, exactly. investigation and they said, what, what did you learn from that? Did you learn that that was good investigation that led to something? Or did you say, oh, look, if we pick out what we want to happen out here and then conveniently fill in the facts underneath that, that'll make for good journalism. And I think they learned the latter, not the former. Well, you know, you know, the way to make a great journalistic career, to become famous. Hey, we could even get a movie made out of us the way Woodward and Bernstein had one. Journalists are, are, are a very ambitious group of people. They want their voices out there, and so they, they will see themselves not so much as watchdogs in, in, in the old-fashioned sense, but they want the sensational story. I mean, sitting there, sitting there in the city council meeting (laughs) and seeing what those council members are up to in transfers of money and reaching constituents, that can be a kind of boring, tiresome activity, sitting there all afternoon. I mean, the council members themselves, half of them are asleep. And but that's the real job right. of, of journalism. That's the civic duty that they have. Well, it's much better to sit there in, in front of your computer at home and, and, and grab a photo of Bruce Jenner and do your, do your riff on it. Right. And, and so opinion journalism thus takes over for real journalism, which we've seen for a long, long time. And a lot of people don't remember then the Woodward Bernstein case. That started out as a rather mundane task, too, as going into a, a courtroom and not quite sure what you were going into. And then it led to a lot of other places. Huh. Isn't that amazing? Huh. But I don't, yeah. I don't think they were thinking about becoming famous or becoming Woodward Bernstein, becoming iconic in this country. Final question for you. You... Uh, contend that cultural renewal is still possible, how do we stop the continued 
deterioration of the American mind right now because I, I am in total agreement that it's deteriorated to a point that it gives us great concern. And a lot of people will say, are we going to turn it over to the X generation or the Y generation, if you like, or the millennials or whoever to carry this forward? And if so, what will turn the tide around? Well, I... I, I don't know, but we have to look at American history and say we are the longest-running government on Earth. We've had many dark times with the Revolutionary War, which was very bloody, uh, the Civil War and, and the Depression and, and uh, you know, the South after Reconstruction, the Cold War, the 70s, and we, we recovered we we came back from things, but here was the crucial variable. In those episodes, we had George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, right. Booker T. Washington, FDR, Ronald Reagan. We need we need great leaders to mobilize a lot of these populist energies. In 2008, Barack Obama's campaign was was for many uh, uh, an inspirational moment. Yes, it was. brought a lot of the young out. But Barack Obama quickly proved himself to be not a great civic figure. He was a politician all the way down. He's good at picking fights. He's not good at making enemies into allies. And that, that, that's, that's, the, that's what a great politician can do. That's what turns a politician from being just a politician into, into a leader. This is what we need to have happen. And the idea that a leader will go about the business of the United States, which is to unify, to, to make it united, not a, a divided states of America, uh, and to bring us together with one look at an American spirit again, uh, as opposed to the divisive look at American spirit. And, you know, whatever you think America is, that's what it is. That's not how we have survived. Mark, uh, I hope you will come back again. I, I am fascinated by the book. I, I As I continue to read it, I'm sure I'm going to be even, even more fascinated, and I would encourage people to buy it uh, June 16th. I'm sure it will be out on Amazon and in bookstores, but it's called The State of the American Mind, 16 Leading Critics on the New Anti-Intellectualism. Mark, uh, fabulous interview this morning. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Mark, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so very much. Okay. Mark Bauerlein with us here on the Gary Sutton Show, The State of the American Mind. 16 leading critics on the new anti-intellectualism, and it's not just a right or left book. It really does, if you're not afraid, if you're not afraid to have uh, your senses challenged a little bit, it is absolutely a fantastic read, and I'm continuing through with it, and we're going to get Mark back on again some other time. I'll be anxious to see what you thought about the interview this morning at 1135 when it's your turn to make the call.